the Happy Spaceman. He has no other name. His past is easily discoverable, but his work is relatively obscure. He uploaded his first video at age 11. Since then, he has received so many views that YouTube still demonetized him. He brought nostalgia to High School Musical. He brought Monster Mash to public attention. He watched a One Direction documentary without wanting to chug bleach. His series, Was It Really That Bad?, reevaluated critically hated albums long before Todd in the Shadows had the same idea. Now, he is reviewing an older film of relative obscurity to inaugurate his 10th anniversary, his first decade of creating content, Phantom of the Paradise, the ultimate rock opera. This is a story of that film, of that review, of the man who made it, the spaceman who reviewed it, and the cameos that stole it. Yeah, I'm back. Hey, hey, welcome to my new apartment. Yeah, I moved up here to go to college in DC, so you're gonna be seeing this location for the next few videos. Uh, sorry about my pretentious intro, by the way, but that was just to build up hype for part two of my 10th anniversary special review of Phantom of the Paradise. What a goofy, fun movie. I bet the next scene is gonna be hilarious. Have to sleep a hero. Is it only in my mind? You know, I am starting to see why this movie didn't do as well as other B-movies at the time. Namely, it's free and depressing! Winslow is sure he's writing the song for Phoenix, but as it turns out, Swan has different plans. She's perfect, but you know how I have more perfection than anyone but myself. The movie was even able to afford cameos for this scene. Look, there's Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, um, Anne and Nancy Wilson, I don't know, Hank Williams Jr., the Pointer Sisters, and of course, Rob Halford. Swan shows up for a press conference, and... <laughs> talk about seamless editing. That logo wasn't obviously added in post-production. You can actually see edits like this throughout the movie, where the Death Records logo replaces the original record company name, Swan Song Enterprises. Among the numerous lawsuits I mentioned in part one of this review, one of them involved the use of the name Swan Song, when, shortly before this film's release, Led Zeppelin's manager Peter Grant created a real-life company called Swan Song Records. Due to the use of the name, Grant apparently threatened to block the release of the film with legal action and his notorious mob connections. To add insult to injury, Grant had previously been the manager of a band called Stone the Crows, whose lead singer died of an on-stage electrocution incident in 1972, and, minor spoilers, one of the characters in Fan of the Paradise later dies of electrocution. Now granted, the production crew behind Fans of the Paradise could have easily still used the Swan Song name, given that it was a widely used term before Grant created his record company. But to make sure the movie got out on time, they complied with his demands and removed every mention of Swan Song Enterprises from the movie. But my god is it sloppy! I mean, I get it. These edits were being implemented at the last minute. Apparently they were still being made within three weeks of the film's release and cost the studio an extra $22,000. But come on, look at these, that's just obvious! Remember that scene earlier with the weird dissolve and pan transition? Apparently it was originally supposed to pan down from a street sign that said Swan Song Plaza, and that would have been awesome! Why'd they cut it? Hell, the scene where the receptionist was flipping through the pages was also edited, but the uncut version had a bunch of other names like Abby Hoffman and Bob Dylan, an easter egg that was sadly left out of the original cut. This even involved cutting down long, extended shots that would have been much more effective. Even the poster got edited! But even then, the swan song name and logo still pops up everywhere in the movie. Like here, 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 and here, if you flip the footage around, you can see that it clearly does not say Death Records. I know this happened over 40 years ago, and it's kind of a moot point bringing it up, but I just have to ask Peter Grant, was it worth it? You may also notice that journalists are repeatedly denied the right to take pictures of Swan, including one getting his camera confiscated when he tries. Well, as I said earlier, FORESHADOWING! Yeah, Mr. Swan, now who's gonna be singing this? The Juicy Fruits? 
No, no, they're a reflection of the past. Also, they are kind of dead. Wait, never mind. They're now just dressed in different outfits and are covered in bandages. Guess the explosion didn't kill them. Apparently, the original intention was to have the Juicy Fruits be played by real-life music group Sha Na Na, and the later bands, the Beach Bums and the Undeads, would have been played by the Rolling Stones and the Who. But this wound up being too expensive, and they instead decided just to have the same three singers play them wearing different costumes. Though, this unintentionally adds another layer to this movie. People like to talk about how pop stars are interchangeable, and how they all look and sound alike, like they're mass-produced. This movie takes it all the way by having them all literally be the same three singers! But get ready, ladies and gentlemen, because now is the point when we get the greatest character introduction of all time. We meet the one, the only, start with this guy. Beef is the most entertaining, most fun to watch thing in this entire movie. Nearly every scene, you can tell that actor Garrett Graham is just enjoying the hell out of his performance. It's just great. We'll see more of Beef later, but first... Uh, don't even think about continuing. Let me guess, you're also supposed to be the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> oh, you would assume that, wouldn't you? Ah, oh, no. I am the Phantom of Star Trek Trivia. Star Trek? What the hell does this have to do with Star Trek? Well, in the Voyager episode Death Wish from season 3- Wait, isn't Voyager supposed to be the worst of the shows? N no, that that's Discovery, but regardless. In that episode, a member of the Q Continuum who became known as Quinn was found by the crew of Voyager, finding life had grown dull and that he wanted to end his life. Through a long ordeal, he was finally granted mortality as a human, but in the end, he killed himself anyways. And how does that connect to Phantom of the Paradise? Well, Quinn was played by none other than Garrett Graham, Beef himself. Hmm. Well, thank you for that trivia. Now will you please leave? Not quite yet. He also played a hunter in the Deep Space Nine episode Captive Pursuit. Okay, now will you leave? And Paul Williams played Koru in the Voyager episode Virtuoso. Are you done yet? <laughs> I will never be done. <laughs> Are we sure that's not just what the movie crew took daily? More interesting trivia. The studio where the fandom is recording Faust is actual real-life recording studio, The Record Plant, and all the knobs behind them actually belong to Tonto, the famous gigantic modular polyphonic synthesizer. So they may not have been able to secure the film or East, but hey, at least they got that. Oh, did I say you could see more of Beef later? Well, by later, I meant... Something bothering you, B? Swan, this was scored for a check. I'm not doing it in drag. You can sing it better than any bitch. You don't know how right you are, Goliath. <laughs> you wanna know what really makes this scene? It's not even the dialogue or Beef's performance. No, what really makes this scene funny is Phoenix's reaction to it. She's just so done. My eyes turn slow! Watch out, Swan. The door's handle might get you sued. But it turns out that Swan has sinister plans in mind for Winslow. Seal it now. For the love of God, Swan! Yes, for the love of God. I'm seeing an awful lot of swans in this exterior shot. Are you trying to taunt Peter Grant? What was that? What was that? Hey, I saw that swan logo. Don't you try to hide it. Also, why is Beef wearing antlers? Oh, apparently the Phantom turned into the Kool-Aid Man. And Beef seems just like the type of guy to keep a picture of himself on his mirror. Oh hey, it's a reference to Psycho. That's totally unlike Brian De Palma to reference Hitchcock. Though this scene goes in a bit of a different direction. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's just... Look at him, he's using a toilet plunger! <laughs> Wonder why they didn't put that in the poster!
Anyway, Philbin notices Beef leaving, and it's easy to spot him since this is the first scene where he's wearing a shirt. You're gonna miss the show. There ain't gonna be no show. What? Listen, Philbin. There really is a phantom. Ooh, that'll make a great line for the trailer. There really is a phantom. 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 Ah! Shit, now how did that really happen? <gasps> Can't you feel the vibes in your own house? Bad sport. Real bad. I mean, the karma's so thick around here, you need an aqua lung to breathe. Can confirm, I'm pretty sure the phantom was using one earlier. Either that or it was Darth Vader. Okay, so we've had musical parodies of the nostalgia wave, surf music, folk rock, country, and R&B. Wonder what this next one's gonna be. There's nothing that's harder to find. I'm sorry, did this movie just predict the rise of Kiss? <laughs> you know, some movies don't hold up so well years after their release. Other movies hold up spectacularly well. Guess which category this one's in? Admittedly, their makeup is more similar to the silent horror film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is also an inspiration for the beef reveal scene earlier. Well, that and Alice Cooper, if you couldn't tell by the fact that their band starts decapitating audience members. I can't tell. Wasn't the audience ever confused as to why a bunch of mannequins and puppets were out there with them? Considering the audience that typically attends Swan's shows, probably not! But boy, if this doesn't prove how versatile a songwriter Paul Williams really is. He can do everything from beach pop jams to friggin' metal! Okay, this one shot is something that critics always like to use as proof that this movie supposedly ripped off the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Because as we all know, having a similar costume automatically makes one movie a complete ripoff of a different movie. For the record, yes, I am aware that the play The Rocky Horror Show debuted in 1972, two years before Phantom of the Paradise. But calling Phantom a ripoff of Rocky Horror is a little bit shallow when A, the two movies are completely different in tone, and B, when the script for Phantom was written in 1969. There goes the Phantom. Not quite sure why he hadn't stopped the show from happening like he said he would. So, I guess Beef is supposed to be some kind of Frankenstein's monster thing? Except I'm pretty sure Frankenstein's monster never exposes balls to the world! His name may be Beef, but they may as well call him Ham, because every scene he's in is just Garrett Graham hamming it up. How the hell does this fit in with the story of Faust anyway? It's probably clear by now that Beef is this movie's equivalent of Carlotta, the singer called upon to replace Christine, or in this case, Phoenix. In the original novel and silent movie of The Phantom of the Opera, after the Phantom warns Carlotta not to sing but she goes up anyway, the Phantom drops the chandelier on her. This scene has since become iconic and has been done in some form or another in most movie and stage adaptations of The Phantom of the Opera. Let's see how Phantom of the Paradise handles the chandelier crash scene. Oh, you might satisfy me! Okay, okay, okay. What the hell just happened? I feel like I should go back and analyze that scene because I have a lot of questions about this sequence of events. First of all, he uses a neon prop of a lightning bolt that he throws at the stage and somehow electrocutes Beef to death. It doesn't stab into him or anything, it lands a couple feet off to the side. What sense does that make? We don't see it land on an amp or anything, so I don't get how this worked. Second, half of these faces can double for jizz faces. Nice. In my pants. Third, this scene is another one of those that would have been a lot more effective if it weren't spoiled in the trailer. What the hell? Fourth, when Phoenix is sent on stage to sing after they clear Beef's body, the Phantom just strangles some random stagehand operating a spotlight. Why? Why'd you kill that dude? How'd that benefit you in the slightest? Fifth, this is the crowd after Beef's death. And here is what happens when Phoenix goes up to sing. Am I the only one who gets kind of bugged by this? Like, have you seen raucous crowds before? They aren't just going to silence themselves for someone singing softly, especially subsequently after stridently screaming for a presently deceased singer they are obsessed with. Alliteration! This happened in the first High School Musical, and it bugged me there too. Though it was worse there because that was a sports crowd. They're even harder to silence. They'd be more likely to burn disco records than to be quiet. All that said, though, this is still a rather nice scene. We're all souls in a 
It's a genuinely beautiful song, for one thing. Jessica Harper sings it rather well, but it's also very emotionally effective. Here we have Winslow, whose life has been ruined, whose music has been mutilated, but finally, he's allowed to hear his music being performed his way by the singer of his choosing, and the crowd absolutely loves it. William Finley makes great use of visual acting in this scene, allowing the limited space on his mask to emote. We see him smile and tear up as, for one brief moment in his life, things are actually going right. Immediately followed by things going wrong again. I blame the editor, who is clearly trying to turn this into a Looney Tunes short. Swan goes to check on her and, <laughs> way to break the ice, dude. Is beef dead? But let's not talk about that, let's, uh, let's talk about you. Hey babe, the dude I set up to replace you has just been burned to death. Anyway, let's bang! Animas, puke, guys having sex with dead bodies. You ready to go back to my place? What am I doing wrong? I like your name, we won't have to change it. That is, until a certain French indie band take the same name. The Phantom kidnaps Phoenix and drags her to the rooftop, where they watch the still frantic crowd cheering Beef as his body is taken to the ambulance. You wasn't listening to me! Eh, it was destined to happen. Of the three main characters named after animals, Beef was the only one named after a dead animal, and Phoenix was destined to rise from his ashes. Don't you just love symbolic names? I would never hurt you, Phoenix. You know me. I was a But Winslow's dead. No, not quite. Because Swan's taken my voice, my music, and given me this. <laughs> and now he wants you, but you are all I have left. You know, I can't tell if Phoenix is scared by his facial scarring, or the fact that under his mask, he's apparently caked with makeup on the other side. Might want to wash that off, buddy. Hmm, there's a light over at the Frankenstein place. Ah, oh, damn it. Now how's this for punishment? After all he's been through, Winslow now has to watch the love of his life do the schmiggity with his mortal enemy, who also happens to be Paul Williams. The squick is ultimately too much for him to handle as he decides to end his life. Okay, okay, okay. No more fake credit scenes in my reviews. I don't think anyone actually falls for them anymore. Winslow, what a foolish thing to do. Didn't you read your contract closely? This contract terminates with Swan. No more suicides, Winslow. You gave up your right to rest in peace when you signed this contract. That stays sealed only as long as I have the power to bind you. If I'm destroyed, that gaping wound opens. You might say we terminate together. Okay. I am going to make a statement, controversial as it may be, in regards to this scene. <clears throat> this is why I believe that Swan is a ten times better villain than Dr. Frankenfurter. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong! Tell me I'm wrong! I don't care! It's the truth! Yes, Frank is a lot of fun to watch. Yes, he's a large ham. Plus, he's Tim Curry. But in the end, he's nothing but a psychopath who acts upon his every changing whim. Meanwhile, Swan manages to be both entertaining and truly scary. He has a phantom trapped right under his finger, in a place where he can do with a phantom whatever he pleases, and no matter how the dice may roll, Swan will always win. He basically invented the Xanatos Gambit before Xanatos was even a thing! It's also interesting to note that Swan, being a 5'2", bird-obsessed, top-hat-wearing villain, serves as a parallel to Paul Williams' later voice role the Penguin in Batman the Animated Series. I find your middling machinations mildly diverting. But for sheer criminal genius, none surpasses my most recent ornithologically inspired entoilment. And in case you thought there were no more layers to Swan's character? I'm under contract too. Things get even scarier when we see the old Rolling Stone logo! The Phantom manages to break into Swan's room. Okay, as good a villain Swan is, that part's admittedly a little bit weak. As we finally get some backstory on Swan. November 19th, 1953. Today I have decided to kill myself. Why? Simple. I'm 
getting old. To see this beautiful face ravaged by the forces of time. That's rough, buddy. If I can't be young forever, I'd rather end it all. Why not? What? Stay young forever. I'm real. But I am stoned. <laughs> and it really doesn't matter what happens, does it? Oh, this is too much. I guess you're supposed to be the devil. I go by many names. And you will make me young forever. This image will age in your place. So yes, as it turns out, Swan signed a Faustian contract with the devil to keep him looking young forever. A twist that was unexpected, but I would be lying if I said it weren't well delivered. It's a shout out to Oscar Wilde's novel The Picture of Dorian Gray, and an interesting parallel with Winslow's rock opera, in that the story of Faust has happened for real, like a rock opera within a rock opera. It also adds yet another layer to Swan's character. Has he always been this evil, or did he start out as just being a brilliant musician, and only become evil later on from the corruption of having sold his soul to Satan? That's the funny thing about 70s B-movies. By nature of their design, they are camp, goofy, often exploitative popcorn films, but every once in a while, a smart movie manages to slip its way under the radar. Though I do have to admit, there is one part of this scene that kind of bugs me. Have you figured it out yet? If the film of Swan is supposedly growing older in place of him, then why does he look exactly the same? I don't get it. This film was supposedly taken in the 1950s, yet he doesn't look a day older now than he did back then. Also, why is the footage of Winslow and Phoenix signing on the same role as that of Swan? That seems rather short-sighted, especially given that the devil said this to him. And the tape from which the picture comes must be guarded at all costs. Why? Or when it goes, you go. And why does he also put the footage of him paying off a hitman to kill Phoenix in the same role of film? Don't you realize that the Phantom now knows your entire plan and can easily destroy the film footage, causing you to age rapidly and instantly become mortal? Oh yeah, and one day of being with Swan turned Phoenix into a drug addict. Why am I not surprised? Let's take a look at that wedding ceremony. <laughs> that scene was so 70s that I feel like I'm getting a contact high just by watching it. Well, the Phantom prevents Phoenix from being murdered, knocks out the Hitman with his own gun, and doesn't take the gun to shoot Swan for some reason. So Swan's mask is removed and eh, he doesn't look that much older, he really just looks like he face planted in some pizza. Though admittedly, that's just because I know what older Paul Williams really looks like. Did I mention that Swan was based on notorious music producer Phil Spector? To the point where Swan's original name in the script was Spector? <laughs> so yes, in addition to predicting the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Star Wars, Autotune, and The Rise of Kiss, this movie also predicted Phil Spector's transformation from hit-making producer to notorious misogynistic murderer. My god, I love this movie! Winslow finally kills Swan, with help from the audience, who still believe that it's all part of the act, but this causes his own wound to open back up. In his sacrifice and dying moments, Phoenix finally recognizes him and realizes that he was a songwriter who had been so kind to her before. Though I don't quite know why she didn't realize that the first time. Maybe it's because all his makeup disappeared here? And Winslow tragically dies in Phoenix's arms. Though that's not nearly as tragic as the movie's critical and box office reception. Phantom of the Paradise was released to... barely any reception at all, though most of it negative. Perhaps most scathing was Rex Reed's review, saying, You'll want to throw up. I can't think of anything within recent memory that I've hated more. Dude, you were in Myra Breckenridge. You're no longer allowed to have standards. Totally lacking in structure, style, coherence, and talent. Okay, every word of that sentence was a lie. It should have been reviewed with a machine gun. Yep, because I don't like this movie, everyone involved in it should be shot. Check out this comment he made about William Finley. Did it never occur to Brian De Palma that it might harm his horror rock ambitions to hire an actor so hideous that when he changes into the fandom there is hardly any visible difference? 
Dude, he wasn't supposed to be attractive. That was the entire point. The music should stand on its own rather than being dependent on the singer's physical attractiveness. To show how the industry has become a corrupt, self-consuming business where actual talent is pushed aside for superficiality like yours, you moron! However, at the end, he concludes that there might be an army of college kids who find this claptrap amusing. Great, so as a college kid, I can tell you to piss off! There was also this negative take from Gene Siskel, which I won't focus on too much, aside from the fact that he miscredited Garrett Graham as a fandom instead of William Finley. It could have happened, given that Brian De Palma allegedly went back and forth between which of the three leads should have been played by Finley, Grant, and Williams. Hell, John Voight and Mick Jagger were allegedly in the running to play Swan at one point. Other reviews were mixed to positive, but that didn't help with box office sales, bombing on a $1.3 million budget. I recall hearing a story when Brian De Palma went to a screening of this in New York, only to find the theater empty. Much of this can be traced back to the fact that this movie really wasn't advertised well. I mean, look at this! That's not what Jessica Harper looks like! Wait a minute. He's been maimed and framed, beaten, robbed, and mutilated, but they still can't keep him from the woman he loves? They were only in three scenes together! It didn't help that with all the great art in the posters for the movie, for some reason they decided to go with this photo on the DVD cover. The most acclaimed horror p fantasy of our time? That's only by default. There aren't exactly a lot of other horror p fantasies to compare it to. The movie's video advertising didn't do particularly well either. Aside from the main trailer, which I've already picked apart enough, there were several TV spots with radio personality Wolfman Jack of all people. It's a horror story. It's a love story. It's a comedy. We really didn't know how to market it. The most promotion this movie ever received on TV came when Paul Williams performed the hell of it on the short-lived Brady Bunch Variety Hour. And judging by the fact that half of you probably didn't even know that was a thing, you can guess how much of that helped. Aside from De Palma, who we all know is still doing fine with his directing career, one other person involved in this movie to achieve huge success after the fact was the set designer Sissy Spacek, who later made a name for herself as an actress with De Palma's next film, Carrie. Sadly, despite the later success of both the director and the cast, the movie itself would lapse into obscurity. Everywhere except, oddly enough, Winnipeg, Canada. Yeah, it was successful nowhere else in Canada, but for some reason it was absolutely huge in Winnipeg. It ran consecutively for 18 weeks there, and then got picked up by other theaters and ran until 1977. Since then, it's become something of a classic there. There's a fan website, the Swan Archive, dedicated to Phantom of the Paradise that's based in Winnipeg. Also, no kidding, there is a fan convention for this movie held in Winnipeg! It's called Phantom Palooza! I'm not making this up! It was also weirdly successful in El Salvador, where Goodbye Eddie Goodbye became a number one hit. When Brian De Palma released Dress to Kill in 1980, it was allegedly advertised there as being from the director of Phantom of the Paradise, an honor it achieved nowhere else in the world. Hell, in 1987, when Archie Hahn had a bit part in Amazon Women on the Moon, he was allegedly given top billing there. To this day, nobody has any idea why these locations in particular enjoyed this movie. But all I can figure is that these locations had exquisite taste in films. Guys, this movie is a masterpiece. It's well written, it has many memorable characters who are all acted well, the soundtrack is friggin' amazing, and it has so many layers to it and such a deep message that people could write a college essay about it. Which I did. On top of that, it's just really fun. I know that this quality is more subjective and your mileage may vary, but it's one of the most rewatchable movies I've ever seen. I would highly advise checking it out if you haven't already. It deserves to be more well known than it is. Well, that's my review. I hope you like it, and, well, I'll catch you later. And that concludes my 10th anniversary review of Phantom of the Paradise. I hope you liked it. Special thanks to Magnetrex, Black Scarab Films, The Second Opinion, and Quillsniv for all agreeing to appear in this. I will be making more videos, so don't forget to subscribe if you want to stay updated on when I post new stuff. And feel free to donate to my Patreon if you want early access and other exclusive content. I will catch you guys in my next video. We need a man that's sophisticated. I'm not doing it in drag.